Welcome everyone to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. Uh, finally, after months of organizing, uh, it sounds like you're just super glamorous and busy. Um, I've got uh, a, a Tim Love, who has the best name ever also, um, onto the show. Uh, he's a musician and a friend. We've, we've hung out here and there. We've got similar, well, we've got certain crossovers as far as our stories with addiction and, and things like that. Um, yeah. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming. No, thank you for having me. It's uh, yeah, it's been a long time coming and glad we're here. Here we are. Um, yeah. so tell us a little bit about you. Uh, what, are you in, what are you passionate about at the moment? What do you do? Um, at the moment, I, well, as I said, I'm a musician. So yeah, there's a lot of guitar going on. Um, you know, I love, I love learning. I love learning new things. Um, I've just sort of picked sort of photography and cinematography back up. Cool which I'm going to sort of adapt hopefully this year into, you know, my new, well, not new, but my current YouTube channel, which is a bit stale and stagnant. So yeah, I'm sort of getting into that. And, but, um, yeah, I love to read. Um, You've got some kids, haven't you? A couple of kids running around. Some children. Yeah, they're both at school at the moment. So it's kind of calm. It's nice. Nice. They're well, younger than mine. How old are yours? They're six, no, seven and eight. Seven and eight, and yes, we're married with a wife who's at work at the moment. Lovely. Yeah, so that's, that's yeah, that's, that's a little, me. little picture, cool. Um, tiny, tiny, yeah. Tiny yeah. picture. It's a little picture. It's a snapshot. Mm. Um, so you're a bit of a creative, I guess. So you've got the, the music and the, the cinematography, uh, photography, I think you said as well. Um, yeah. They're all kind of expressions, aren't they? That kind of uh, allow you to, I don't, I don't know, what do you get out of it? What's, what get, what well, is it? Things, things like photography and cinematography, I'm just literally starting out. So it's, it's a lot of trial and error, a lot of getting home and opening up and going like, that is all garbage. That's all going straight in the bin and we're going back out and trying again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, music, you know, I've been playing guitar since I was 17. So 22 years. Um, and I've been earning a living from it since 2002, I think, 2001, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I started, I started out teaching yeah. when I was at college and then sort of progressed into getting paid gigs, which, well, which is the hardest thing about being a musician is getting paid work. So, Well, it's the constant hustle, isn't it? Um, constant, yes. And one-off gigs and you've just got to keep, keep hustling. Yeah. Uh, which is stressful. Hmm. I mean, I know a little bit about it just through my own business and, you know, hustling for work and um, mm -hmm. stressful, isn't it? Um, yes. When you've got nothing coming in, like I'm looking at my at March and I'm like, I've got two gigs in. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, you know, if it stays like that, you know, it's, you know, I can, I can use that time and, you know, I can spend it with the kids and I can maybe do stuff with them. Um, if we can find we'll find stuff to do so yeah you you adapt and learn right and you're, yeah. you're 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 pretty resilient so give us a bit of context to like growing up what was that like like did your parents sort of and the education system help build your resilience or what was that um like? i don't know i don't know if i would say that i was resilient i don't know that i don't know maybe i think i'm quite fairly resourceful um but yeah growing up i'm the oldest of six so there was, it seemed like there was always a baby popping in every kind of few years. And you're the um, old one, right? I hated school. Did you? I, I detested school, which is odd because... You love learning. I love learning, yeah. And I remember, well, I don't remember. My parents told me that, you know, they said that, you know, you did your first couple of days at school, first couple of weeks at school. And when we did the first kind of parent-teacher chat, they were just stunned when the teacher said that, you know, he doesn't really pay attention. He doesn't listen really. He daydreams, he dawdles. He... Why were they stunned? Because they said before you went to school, you know, you were reading, you were counting, you were doing all the sort of, you know, quite, a, I don't know if it was advanced was the word that they were used, but they were kind of like, right, well, he's ready for school. And off he went and came back with his mixed report. So I think the problem is, is I don't do well in big groups. Got it. I really sort of, I, I just blend into the background. I just become part of the furniture. So, and that's, it's still the same today. I can literally be in a room with, you know, 20 or 30 people and I could disappear and no one would notice, which, um, 
which is something that I discovered about myself after sort of coming into recovery and getting clean and sober because I used alcohol and drugs as a kind of a way to sort of push myself to the front and kind of colour myself and make myself more interesting. But now I don't have that anymore. and I now have to live with myself as I am. Yeah, that's the hardest bit is accepting ourselves. But you're saying you yeah. can recognise from that early, 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 early age mm. that you just, the group thing just didn't make you do well at school. You just yeah. To, to hide or, you know, it, it just wasn't your happy place. First, you know, the first sort of five or six years of school, in terms of being happy there, I, I was. You know, I had a really nice, tight-knit group of friends that, um, that I got on really well with, but it, it was the same story throughout every year at primary school, was that it has the capacity to do well, just doesn't pay attention. And, you know, it's... I still do that now. I still find myself just sitting there just daydreaming and twiddling my fingers, and then two hours have gone by, and like, oh, shit, I should probably go out and do something. But don't they say that daydreaming, like, for creatives is actually a good thing? You know, obviously, we don't want to veer on the side of never doing anything. No, no. But, like, it, you spark ideas, or you find yeah. things that other people wouldn't. I've, I've read that, too, but the trouble with me is, is I'll use that as an excuse not to do anything. <laughs> Okay. So I, I, have to try and find a, I have to try and find a balance, like everything, I have to try and find a balance. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, 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 the trouble with me is that I, I, motivation doesn't come quickly and easily, and I don't think it does for many people. Um, and I'll sit and procrastinate and research and watch videos, and I'll just make sure that all my ducks are in a row before I start. And... Um, I think my wife is kind of different. She'll be just like, just go and do it. Just shut up, stop thinking about it, just go and do it. So, yeah, but then I'll, I kind of flip flop between the two. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you know, the, we just moved house and we're um, sort of redecorating. And maybe Monday and Tuesday, I'll, you know, I'll paint the whole room, but then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'll do nothing. And, um, she kind of she, she might say something along the lines of I don't understand why you don't just go and do it yeah and then right there and then I go fine I'll go and do it now she said no I don't need to do it now do it some other time quite an quite yeah. extremist right do you just do yeah she says she says this, you know you'll go from just doing nothing to go and doing everything and let's try and find something in the middle again it comes back to balance absolutely it's the eternal journey though isn't it and it's funny in relationships how we do the the opposites attract thing or there's certain bits where we're we can be very opposite to each other which yeah. in theory i think allows us to grow and learn how to balance out and meet you know give each other something and meet in the middle yeah. uh, but my god relationships are a testing ground before we get to that yes. um, <laughs> <laughs> um so so you so your early years in school um you were happy just you, you do have friends did, were you did you have lots of responsibility at home if you're the oldest of six mm -hmm. No, no, uh, I don't really remember it. I mean, there was, no, not really. There was, it was me and my first sister, which there was about 14, 15 months between us. And then there was like a four year gap. And then like another two or three year gap. And then they kind of went down in increments of sort of two and three years. Um, but no, th th there was never any kind of responsibility to look after them or there was never any real responsibility to, I don't know, almost like guide and mentor. But yeah. there, was things, there was things like, you know, tidy up your room, take your dinner, take your dinner place, wash those things up, take the rubbish out. Sure, sure. Little jobs around the house things, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we, we met, um, you know, at a networking event, but um, connected, I guess, through our shared, uh, you know, recovery and with, with slightly different stories. But What's that journey like for you? So did you become more sort of disenfranchised as a teenager? You, you, you took up guitar at 17, but did, yeah. is that also when, um, when did the, the drugs and alcohol start? They didn't start. I mean, I, I first sort of picked up alcohol 15 and 16, uh, you know, out with friends, but I never had this sort of really negative experience with it. It was relatively positive and... Oh um yeah it was a lot of fun and it kind of it helped kind of unlock me a little bit socially and um but you know there was a couple of weekends and then I didn't 
touch it for six months or so. And so I had a very kind of on and off relationship, never really very negative. Um, and it wasn't until I was about sort of 18 or 19, once I kind of got that license to go and buy it myself legally, um, then I just found myself sort of coming home from work, drinking alone. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then, you know, you go out Friday and Saturday and, and it kind of came to a point, maybe I was 19 and a bit, maybe 20. And I had like this mini breakdown and just, and then I, just, I stopped drinking. Was it was the breakdown just, connected to the, the alcohol use? Oh, or absolutely. Yeah. Stresses or it was, no, yeah. Yeah. It was all that. It was, I think there was like my first kind of breakup as well that went that added to it and then um yeah I, you know and I met somebody else when I was sort of in my early 20s and I didn't drink for three or four years that relationship ended and then I picked it up and I was right back where I started and just started to sort of spiral down it was kind of triggered often by an event a relationship yeah. breakup or something yeah yeah it was definitely used as a substitute and then um yeah early 20s I found cocaine and it did all the things that alcohol couldn't do. So alcohol took me to a one point and then cocaine sort of pushed me into this whole new realm. It's like, this is, this is amazing. I'm going to do this forever. Um, what did it give you? What was the... You know, you felt a little bit taller, a little bit stronger, a little bit sexier, a little bit more talkative, a little bit more community, everything. And it just sort of really um, heightened all of those kind of states, those social states that, you know, and, and all of that, uh, social anxiety and fear that I had pushed to the background and it just it was just it was gone and then um, yeah again same with alcohol I had this, this kind of on off relationship with it where I'd do too much things would get really awful and I'd stop uh, and I'd stop for a good you know six months nine months and then slowly I'd pick it back up and then it would slowly start to go back to the way it was it was just awful again yeah and then I'd stop and then, you know, this roller coaster of, and then when I stopped, um, I'd kind of convince myself, look, everything's okay. You know, I'm doing really well. Relationships are going really well. And um, sort of convinced myself that I could pick it back up again. And I would, and then phew, nosedive. And was, was there anyone in your life at the time who was kind of holding up a mirror or saying this is a problem? Was it part of why the relationships broke up or? No, because when I was in these, past relationships I wasn't drinking oh I see so when they ended it spiraled out yeah yeah what about friendships though or your workplace or was it was yeah. anyone going dude I think you should yeah. <laughs> yeah I had various sort of different groups of friends and they would all comment you know you I think you're using quite a lot yeah um and when you know I was about 24 25 and I kind of said to everybody said look you're right I'm, I'm using too much and I need to stop and and I didn't. I stopped for about three or four years. I carried on drinking. And I wasn't able, when I realised that I was in this hole, I wasn't then able to sort of pull myself out the way that I had done. And it was that I'd have this same kind of resolve every morning to stop. And then by the afternoon, I was drinking again. And, yeah, it was, it was, it was, you know, it was just horrible. It was just, it was terrifying. It, it, having that kind of that desire to stop and that desire to sort your life out and then when you try and you really try and you put everything into stopping and you know hours later you're back where you started yeah so talk us through how bad it got for you like what were some of your rock bottom points what made you and i imagine there were like you know not not only one but um what led you to begin thinking you know something's got to change um, you know, when you, when I started sort of drinking as, you know, as soon as, as soon as the house was empty, as soon as the kids were at school and or they were at nursery and play group or whatever. And when you start drinking and then you pick them up from school, then you come home and you continue and you, you start using as well. And then I just get this fear and panic and this anxiety that 
around six o'clock, so I think, right, my wife's going to be home soon, so everything's got to be tidied up, packed away, cleaned away, and I've got to pretend like everything's everything's fine. And um, I just remember it would just tie me up in knots. And it was, it, I don't know, it's really difficult to explain because I wanted so desperately to stop, but I couldn't. And things like, um, so I got arrested for drink driving. I was out on a gig in town. I was arrested for drink driving. I had a minor accident, which actually wasn't my fault. Um, you know, I spent the night in the cell and I came home. My wife said, you know, you need to go to AA. You need to go and do something. You need to sort yourself out because if you don't, I'm leaving. And I remember thinking, nah, it'd be all right. I'll be okay. I'll be able to sort myself out. I don't need to do that. And, um, and I'd, I'd get like a two, three weeks where I wouldn't drink and I wouldn't use and everything would be okay. And, it would, and then I'd, again, I'd use that as the excuse see I can do it see I can stop see I don't need to see right now I can go back out again and yeah life would just spiral down and then I'd hit something else you know I'd hit um you know I had a car crash both the kids were in the car um I hadn't been drinking but I was on the way I'd get this kind of um so I'd finish work I'd pick the kids up think right as, as soon as I can get home the quicker I can get home the quicker I can start drinking and so I was driving like a nutter to get home and, you know, I took my eyes off the road for a second and just drove straight into the back of the car. And I just thought, oh, shit, shit, shit. How am I going to get out of this? And, um, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, if, if I can get out of this, you know, kind of, if I can scrape through this, I'm going to sort my life. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop using. I'm going to stop all of that. And um, literally, I got back home and I went straight up to the shops and bought whatever it is that I felt like because I felt like I'd earned it. Isn't that hilarious? The, 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 yeah. su the subtle mental turnaround from one yeah. extreme to the other in the space of 30 minutes or a day yeah. or half a day or whatever. And I'm also, I mean, I was an alcohol addicted parent. So I yeah. had two toddlers. Um, I equally, I, I had my son in the back once and, and was drunk driving, didn't get arrested, interestingly enough. Maybe it's because I'm a white female, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the shame of being an addicted, and maybe you couldn't have called yourself an addict at the time because you were like, oh, I've got it, it's not a problem. Yeah. But of the impact that we have on our kids, you know, once I got sober, like I had to face up to that shit. And it was, you know, guilt, yeah. shame, and so many horrific things i mean w w but but equally it was my ex-husband now but um saying if you don't sort yourself out if you don't go to aa uh, or something yeah. you know we can't do this and i knew he would keep the kids and yeah. that would be you know and it was both really difficult i used to resent my kids because they prevented me from drinking you know yeah. but equally it was that saving thing i mean like did, did that play a part for you just the the guilt and shame around that but equally did they help you finally sort your shit out um i think when i eventually broke um uh, it's i think it's going to sound a little selfish but it was literally it was all about me yeah it is at the time i and i i absolutely it was you know it was a thursday night and i got you know i was arrested drink driving again for the second time and i just thought i can't do it anymore i literally i've got no more fight left in me i can't it, 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 it's, it's cornered me it's beaten me and I'm not I've, I've got it's, it would be like get, constantly getting into a boxing ring yeah. just getting your, your face pounded and you know how long would it take for you to go actually I'm not going to do that again um, but we as addicts are constantly like, no I can do it I'll give it another crack I'll yeah. step in the ring again and I'll give it another go you know and it was 18 months I remember my youngest daughter she was about 18 months old and she was the first person I admitted to that I was an addict or that I was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And I was holding her, I was in her bedroom, I was crying, it was pathetic. And, you know, I said to you, I'm going to stop drinking and I'm going to, and I, I'm going to stop drinking and I'm going to do it for you. Oh. Everything's going to be for you. You know, and you can measure in hours when I was drinking again. And she was about three, maybe four when I came into recovery. So, you know, um, 
when it eventually happened, it, was, it wasn't like, I'm going to do it for my kids. It wasn't, I'm going to do it for my wife. It wasn't my family or friends. It was literally like, I can't do it anymore. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to step up again. Yeah. And, um, and I remember when I was taken down to the, the police station and I was in front of the custody sergeant desk and she was there filing everything out and she said, you know, do you have a problem with alcohol? And I said, yes. And it was just like, I just, I, I couldn't say no. It just wasn't in me anymore. And she said, do you have a problem with drugs? And I said, yes. And she said, do you want me to refer you to a drinking drugs counsellor? And I said, yes. And she typed it all up on the little computer and it was in the system and then they phoned me and uh, that was it. And um, okay. when I made that, walk of shame back home that Friday morning, you know, I was expecting plates to be thrown, bags to be packed, get out of the house. And I walked in and I sat down and my wife so calmly just looked at me and she said, what are you going to do? Which was worse. Cause I could deal with bags <laughs> being thrown. I could deal with plates <laughs> being thrown. And it was like, what, what's your plan? What are you going to do? And that was it. And I just, I had a friend that was already in recovery. You know, I phoned him up, I sent him a message and two days later I was in a, a Cocaine Anonymous meeting and um, yeah, that was my journey and that was the start of my, my recovery journey. But children definitely play a part in my continued, my continuation of doing what I need to do. Um, yeah. and the same goes for my wife as well, my family and everything else. It's, you know, because I've, I've built up you know, such a strong relationship with them and with my wife and my other family and close friends. And the, the further away I get from a drink, it's like I have so much more to lose. Yeah. And I know exactly what would happen if I do start drinking again. Is that all of that would just get torn down and it would be, it could get torn down in a matter of days. Um, um, there's this, there's this uh, speaker and doctor called Gabor Mate who does lots of stuff on YouTube and whatever and he thinks or has evidence to suggest that all of us addicts and alcoholics have some kind of trauma in our past yeah. and that's not, not a reason or an excuse because there's also mm -hmm. a genetic component and you know we, it's how we're handling it but he thinks that, there's, that the trauma plays a part. I have trauma in my past. Yeah. I can't ever tell, and I'm, I'm curious what you think, if, if, there's, if it's connected to trauma and us trying to deal with a shameful part of ourselves, or if it just feels pretty random and we just have the genetic bad luck of addiction. I don't know. I don't think the two are mutually exclusive, you know, because I, you know, I went through quite severe bullying when I was about between the ages, I don't know, seven and eight. He would do things like that, and it would just be like 20, 30 minutes of, of violence, of being chased around the house, punched, beaten, tripped up, kicked. And um, so there was definitely, an, there was, yeah, you could, yeah, yeah, there was an element of trauma. Whether or not it makes me an addict, I don't know, because I've met people in recovery that have had, you know, a really comfortable upbringing. There wasn't, as far as I'm aware, they haven't divulged that they you know went through any tra trauma or bullying or yeah. you know, violence or sexual um, abuse. Abuse, that's the word. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so I don't know. I think I don't think it helps. No. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I've. I've for you me, know. I, I, def I definitely think it plays a part in my story. The why I drink and the reason why I used. Yeah, I mean, it connects to self-worth and feeling apart, feeling different or like we don't belong. And mm. as you said, when, when, and I would relate to some of that, when you started drinking and especially using, you're a little taller, you're a little stronger, you're like, oh, this is what it feels like to be alive and be part of something. That's yeah. literally the subtle kind of insidious feeling, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and then you end up needing more and more and, and, until you're not belonging anymore because you're drinking at home and you're just in this isolation thing. But you're yeah. still chasing that feeling on some kind of level. Yes. So I guess you reach your several rock bottoms and it leads you to that very first Cocaine Anonymous meeting. And as you and I both know, that's yeah. where, where the real work begins, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's where you're like, fuck, you got to stare face up to your whole self with your past and who you yeah. are and begin to, to, to sort of repair or move forward. I mean, what was those in, initial... 
um, I guess that initial year, I would say the initial first one to five years is incredibly difficult. But especially yeah. that first year, you yeah. got to relearn everything. Like, what was that like for you? Do you know, I don't, it was, it was mostly a blur. Um, I remember there just being moments of utter elation. And then there were moments of just utter despair where, um, you know, I'd be on the phone to people and everything was just brilliant. Everything was coming up me. Um, and I just thought, I'm going to do this forever. This is, this is fantastic. This is everything I wanted, you know. Yeah, and then I'll be on the phone a couple of weeks later just in tears. Just, this is just shit. I don't want to do any of this bollocks anymore. I fucking hate going to these meetings. I fucking hate those people. <laughs> you know, narcissistic control freaks. And I don't want anything, you know. And it's, it was just that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of leveled out a little bit now. Um, the, but the, the biggest lesson for me, the most important part for me was, was just letting things go. I would just hold on to so much and, um, you know, try and control as much as I could. And just that, you, that realization that you can't control anything really it was for me, the, it was a kind of, that's kind of the, the I wouldn't say it's the crux of my recovery, but it's it's certainly the, a, a huge part of just letting things go. You can't control anybody else's behaviour. I can't control how other people view me, how other people see me, how they talk to me. I can only control my reaction to it, and you know how you know my thought process, which is a relearning, um, and it's acknowledging that the buildup of resentment and bitterness and like it's all fuel, right? For us going, well, they're dicks, so I should, I can drink or whatever um, to deal with it. And so what, what next? Like, what are the things that you learn to put in place? What are the things you learn to put in place in order to, to look after yourself? I know you, um, you, do you go to NA or of CA? Like, what do you do now? Uh, I just, I mainly just do CA still. Yeah. Um, I would go to AA occasionally. Um, I find that it's a little bit of an older crowd and I don't relate as much in terms of how, how, we, how I used to drink and use. Um, I definitely feel you know, a more, more connection to, to Cocaine Anonymous. Um, but you know, I, I've got no problems with other fellowships at all. I don't think, I think you know, we're, we're all in the same boat. We're all trying to get clean and sober and however we do it and whatever path we take, it's, you know, it's, it's all, it's all, it's all great. Um, but yeah, no, I, I do one or two meetings a week, you know, I hold various, um, sort of commitments that I've got there. Um, I try and help as many, as many other people as I can. Yeah. And then what's important to you as far as looking after yourself? Cause as we know, um, the, the, the meetings can just be one part of that sort of one puzzle piece and what yeah. are the other things that you do that allow you to live in the real world uh, I'm so trying to do <laughs> supposed to um, one part of or there's, there's a couple of parts of my recovery which I really kind of put down and I've really started to to feel it and notice it through you know, really poor behavior towards my children, um, short temper, short fuse. Um, Your warning signs. Mm. Yeah. And so what I've started to do, I've, I've started to pick back up things like meditation. Okay. Um, closely reviewing my day. Where have I, have I been selfish? Have I been lying? Have I been resentful? You know, um, you know what, and also you know where where have I been sort of trying to help help people? Where have I trying to be helpful? Um, so it literally it was it was today this morning that I started to really sort of pick that back up, and um, fingers crossed it's going to do for me what it did in the in the early days. Um, and that comes back to me being sort of a little complacent and yeah, and it's really hard like a little bit. What's hard is what. We do the stuff and then we feel good 
or better or like we're coping and we're nice to our kids and we're having those nice moments and life is good. And then we're like, man, I'm just going to sleep a little longer. Like, yeah. You know, um, why would I do those things? Let me isolate a little bit. This feels good, nicer in the short term. Yeah. And suddenly it surprises us again, right? That we're in a stressed state or like we just yelled at somebody or we're road rage or whatever it might be. That's our kind of trigger point. And then we're like, yeah. oh God, all right. I know what works. Because yeah. you obviously tested some of those things. And it's like that. It's just a habit change, isn't it? And like circling back to doing the tough stuff, even when we feel okay. Yes. That's that, and that's the tricky thing about recovery is doing all the things that the meditation, the phoning up newcomers, um, reviewing your day, you know, spending a few minutes in the morning to remind yourself what you do have in the world and what you should be grateful for. But when you're feeling really, really good and you're, you think, I don't need to do any of that because I'm doing really well. Yeah. And that's, that's the, the spiral that, that can lead back to, you know, like you know, yeah. isolation, short-tempered, shouting, angry, violent, resentments, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then it's, so it's a tough lesson to learn, but... And keep learning. Yeah, it's, it's good. One of the things that I was taught is, is, to, is to try and always be open and honest about how you're feeling, which before I came into recovery, everything was great. You know, I'm fine. I don't need a problem. I don't have a problem. It's no, I'm cool. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm sweet. I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to open up to people that I, you know, I've got friends or sponsors in the, in, in recovery is really important because first of all, it kind of takes that, it takes the wind out of it because if I'm holding yeah. on to something and it just gets bigger and bigger and once I tell someone it's, just deflates it and it actually becomes far more manageable um so the simple act of talking can just, yeah. as you say just release the pressure yeah and other people can see it in me as well they'll say you don't look right you don't you you're looking a little horse man <laughs> so and then i can either lie and say no i'm fine i'm great it's you or you know again i can just say no it's yeah i've had a really shit day i've done this i've which Something is hard, but I think yeah. actually the, the most important of all the practices, in my opinion, is that opening up. Because it, you can't hide in your secrets. And, and basically, as you were describing, um, it's all about secrets. Like, let me drink at home and, you know, yeah. before my wife comes home and before, like, um, don't let anyone see and hopefully I can hide it, right? Yes. And we end up being forced to come to recovery because the cracks begin to show and we can't hide that shit anyway, even though we're saying one thing everything else is saying something different. So like the habit of radical honesty, and, and, and I do it as well, I've got to say it in the moment. So I'm just like, oh, it's not you, but I think I'm feeling this way, you know, and it just um, diffuses it. Any other practices that help you along your recovery? Um, so meditation, opening up. Yeah. Going to meetings, you've got a few commitments that, that's kind of it that's yeah i think it's just about being you know kind of as open and honest as you can about you know how you're feeling because once you start masking or lying then you know that's that's you're, you're back in old territory again um i try and do i you know i was doing a lot you know kind of a lot of exercise as well but as it's winter, I, I'm okay. finding it difficult to get, to get up and get out. Do you find that the weather affects mood or that you're prone to depression or things like that? Um, no, no, I do. I think I do equally <laughs> well. <laughs> well. <laughs> during, the during the winter as I do okay. you know, during the summer. Um, I'm, I'm not really the most outdoorsy person, so I kind of feel like um, a sense of relief when it's raining. I'm like, ah, we can stay in today. We can put a fire on and watch TV. <laughs> um, but yeah, when it's like the middle of summer and it's sunny, it's like, I've got to go out. I've, I've, I've got to take the kids out. I've, yeah. I, can't, I can't keep them in here. It's unfair. Yeah, um, yeah. But like, like I said earlier about my lack of motivation, once I get up and I get out, then I'm great. It's the same with, you know, if I do have to decorate a room, I just don't want to start. But once I start, I don't really want to stop. And I just want to keep plowing through until 
just kind of up. fiction on a different thing, right? It is. It absolutely is. Once so, you start, you're fucked, and it could be good or not good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Lots of things. Um, do you think that there's any kind of gift in your addiction and in your past story? Do you know, if, if I wasn't an addict and it hadn't brought me, you know, it hadn't cornered me and beaten the shit out of me, I would still be out there drinking and I would still be out there using. So the fact that I'm not a heavy user or a heavy drinker and I cross that line into addiction means that I can now cross back into sobriety. Um, so there is a, a small part of me that is thankful and grateful that, you know, I am, I am what I am. Yeah. Because otherwise, oh, fuck knows where I'd be if I was still drinking. Even if I wasn't drinking as bad or using as bad, I still would be drinking and using. Yeah, and you certainly wouldn't have any reason for self-awareness, for nope. growth, uh, for looking at the tough stuff in yourself, for being a better person, a better husband, a better dad, like all that stuff, it can just numb it out, right? Yeah. And it can stay on the like, well, everyone drinks and it's not that bad and that kind of tightrope. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, so I know, uh, that for me, that, that is a gift. Um, it's, you've got to look really hard to find it, but... Yeah. <laughs> um yeah no i'm very grateful that in a sense that i am an addict and not just a, a yeah. heavy user or heavy drinker i think i've been able to channel that obsessive quality for drink into an obsessive quality for the work that i do and yeah. um luckily my work has impact and and generally spreads goodness and stuff um but i do have to check myself from kind of that workaholic perspective of just like my self-worth and you know is with my adrenaline hits and dopamine hits yeah. all come from work 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 in the absence of relationships and all the other wonderful stuff that there is in the world so this yeah. idea of balance right yeah. is um, just this ongoing process are you still because we before we got on camera you were like oh i don't know if i'm doing that good just yet because you're coming back to a bit of balance you're doing the cycle thing right yes um, yeah do you, do you get really hard on yourself, though, when you slip back a bit? Are you like, for fuck's sake, you should know better, which is kind of what I do. Yes, yeah. I mean, I, I started taking advice from somebody who's in recovery with me who she's about a year less sober than me. Yeah. And she was saying, well, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Are you doing this? Why don't you try doing it? And there's a little part of me that said, shut the fuck up. I've been in any longer than you. Yeah. <laughs> but then that's the part of myself that wants to drink and use. Yeah. That, that kind of addict, selfish, self-centeredness that's, that doesn't want to listen to, you know, helpful advice. Um, but then when I speak to my sponsor about it, who's been in nearly 10 years, he'll say exactly the same thing. I go, yeah, no, you're right. You're, <laughs> yeah, I haven't done that. Um, <laughs> So I guess that's, yes, I think I am hard on myself, but maybe for not the right reasons or the wrong reasons. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, like I won't sit there and sort of really beat myself up over, you know, not doing a day's inventory or missing a morning meditation. I sure. think, right, okay, you know what, I've done it, I've missed it, there's not much I can do about it now. Let's see if I can make it up some in some other way. Um, but, in, you know, there were, I had an incident on Monday morning with my kids. And I was, you know, I was very short-tempered. I smacked my eldest four times in the space of about 15 minutes. And... I, when I, 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 it's going to sound like an overreaction because of that. I want to kill myself. Mm. I literally, I'm, I, it, there's nothing I can do that will ever make up for that. And as a parent, it's absolutely counterintuitive. It's so much worse in the long run. But the reason I got to that stage, because I wasn't having a brilliant morning and then I snapped, I was having a really shit, maybe two weeks, three weeks. And it's eventually come to a point and I've absolutely categorically got to ensure that that never happens again. So if that means 
going back and doing everything that I did in the first six months of recovery, then I'm going to go, go and do that. So in that respect, I'm very hard on myself, which yeah. I think is the right kind of hard of harding yourself to be. Sure. But I guess the, but that's a response then to the, maybe the wrong side of being hard on yourself, which is I want to kill myself, you know? Yes. Yeah. That's probably a little over the top, but a little bit. Um, but, that's, kind of, but, that's where my head goes, goes now. It yeah. never goes have a drink. Go and get some gear. Go and get some pills. It's yeah. kill yourself. Right, which one could argue is um, tricky to deal with as well. But yeah. but you have. But then the knock on effect is I don't want to kill myself. I have a family that I love and that loves me. I've yeah. worked really hard to get to this point. And then you're hard on yourself by going, if I have to do everything that it takes that I did before, even if it takes me a few steps back, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. So you've got this kind of mechanism to talk about it and because because I imagine back in the day you wouldn't have said that you wouldn't have said that that's how you feel and so the fact that you're able to say that's where it takes me and I need to do these things mm. um, that's progress like that sounds like the real recovery uh, yeah I guess so but I, the behavior that led up to that sure definitely regressive um because you that, didn't put the consistent things in place yes yeah that you have to put in place regardless of how you feel. And yeah. that's where it can still lead that kind of dry drunk or, or the, I don't know what the, yeah. the, the drug version of that is, but yeah. <laughs> like the behaviors are still there, even though the booze or the drugs aren't. Yeah. And yeah. that's what we need to constantly keep in check. Yes. And it was, it, it was a real eye opener as well. Um, and it's, you know, it cuts me up that it's, that that's what, Again, that's like another little, another rock bottom. Um, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a wake up call. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and then you have choices. You can go down that loop of unhealthy behaviors, or you can put the thing, which could eventually lead back to drugs or whatever. Yeah, um, no doubt. If eventually, that would spiral down into a, into a position where I think I can't take this anymore, but I know what's going to sort me out and fix everything is I'm going to start drinking. So it's strange. Um, our mind works. Mm, yeah. It was bizarre, and that was another thing that when I came into recovery that I learned is that I don't have a problem with alcohol or drugs. I have a problem with me and life, and alcohol and drugs are my solution to it. Yeah. Which I thought, fuck, that's uh, that really does put the ball in my court because now I've got nothing else, no one else to blame. Well, and it means that if you take the drugs and alcohol away, you can replace it with sugar, with work, mm -hmm. with sex, with unhealthy yeah. relationships, like all sorts of things. Yeah. Because it continues to be a you problem. Or yeah. a problem. And that's essentially um, terrifying, but also liberating. Because it's like, this is the bit that's in our control. It isn't actually about that. It's about with the work that we need to do on ourselves. Yeah. Goodness. Um, finally... What advice would you give to like maybe a musician or somebody who felt isolated as a kid who's like now alcohol or drugs are becoming part of their story? Maybe pre rock bottom, like are there any things that a younger person might ask themselves or that you could have done back in the day to, to, to support yourself that you would have wished you would have known? Um, I think you know opening up and being honest about any past trauma or negative life experiences or anything like that would be really key for, it would have been for me um you know i always tell people if they think that they've got a problem with drink or drugs is to go and see a gp um because there i think there are so many people that do have you know, peripheral problems with drink and drugs that could be sorted out with therapy and counselling. Um, you know, but, you know, 12 step recovery programs work wonderfully when things like therapy and acupuncture and going on long walks and talking about our feelings, when all of that fails, you know, there's quite a, a solid backup. Um, and I think you have to be gen gen genuinely, you have to be honest with yourself. If you genuinely, and you like, I knew, I knew when I was oh, 
24, 25, I would say to people, I can't stop using, I can't stop drinking, I can't stop. And I, you know, and I would stop Yeah. for you know, those little chunks of periods of time. But once you start, you can't stop. But then I'd pick back up again. Um, so those, if you find yourself saying to people, I can't stop, even though you have been able to stop for you know, chunks, of, chunks of time, that's like a real, that should be a real warning sign. That should be a red light. Um, you know, the same way that if you find yourself, you're the last person to be up on a Friday night, Saturday. you're the last person up, you're the last person to go to bed, you're the last person who leaves the party, you're the last person who, I don't know, goes to bed. Getting your drinks, yeah. Yeah, if you're going to the bar, buying drinks three at a time, knocking back two and then coming back with one, that was a good trick of mine. So you can continue the the excessive drinking without anyone saying, well, how many have you had? Um, yeah, my ex-husband used to say, you get drunk really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> you have no idea. I've been drinking, yeah. all I've been drinking since 10 o'clock this morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's so sneaky and manipulative. Um, really good tips. Like when in doubt, ask for help. So you don't have to wait yeah. to get that crisis point. The, the hardest thing, that is, but that's the hardest thing, is, that, is actually asking we somebody. We don't want to admit it to ourselves, right? No. I don't want to be an addict or have that problem, you know, or give it up because that's the thing saving me from my depression and from all the other stuff going on. Yeah. So it's fear, really. Yeah, I mean, it's a fear-based illness. All, all of my life is run and guided by fear and trying to navigate my way around it and push through it. and Yeah, hide from it and hide from other yeah. people. Yeah. I'll do something else. I'll put that to one side and I'll forget fear for a second. I'll do something else. and but. Yeah, it's it's really difficult because once you ask for help and you admit that you you know you if you admit that you can't control your drinking, you can actually then regain a little bit of control if that makes sense. Mm. Once I admitted to somebody that I was an addict and an alcoholic and that I couldn't stop once I started, it then it almost like refocused my life a little bit. Everything that was kind of hazy kind of became a little bit easier to see it's like okay so if i'm an addict and i can't stop and i'm an alcoholic or a drug addict that then gives me almost like a focus a, some a direction to move in so if i'm this and i need to do that then that's 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 the direction that i need to move in there's a path yeah yes. rather than the total chaos from from before yeah. um, so we're coming to the end of our time tim if people want to connect with you either to find out about your music or to hear more of your story or just because they got something out of this and maybe they want some advice, where can they find you? Um, probably Instagram is actually probably the best place. Yeah, it's just Tim, Tim Love Guitar. Tim Love Guitar. Um, yeah. Thank you, Tim. So You're much for your welcome. time and your insight. We finally got you on. I'm excited. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.